she became a tech prodigy in her teenage years. In fact, her talents gained recognition when she participated in an IEEE hardware design contest as a teenager. Now, she didn't win, however, her skills earned her recognition as a top 20 performer and the only participant from Asia to receive an award. In 2005, our piano was featured in an article titled Young Inventors in the New Indian Express. This expressed her passion for computer innovation. Arpana pursued higher education here in the United States, earning a master's degree in electrical and computer engineering from Rutgers University in 2007. Instead of returning home to India, she accepted a job as a software quality assurance engineer at EMC, where she quickly earned a great reputation. Arpana moved to Redmond, Washington, which is known for its tech industry presence, and she built a vibrant social circle despite the fact that she had no friends or family in the area. She learned to ride a motorcycle. She joined a local motorcycle club called the PNW Riders. She volunteered at the Redmond Fire Department and at various animal shelters. She even had aspirations of opening an animal sanctuary for endangered species. She was an active participant in various other activities, including taekwondo and music. So by the age of 24, Arpana had accomplished a great deal, more than me, and she was on her way to making the world a better place. So, on Halloween 2008, Arpana hosted a party at her apartment complex, and I think this was really cool. She and several of the neighbors opened their apartments up for festivities with over two dozen people attending the parties. Now, it is said that during this party, Arpana got into a verbal argument with a male partygoer. I don't know who this male partygoer is or was, but it was reported that this argument was race-related, which makes me furious in a whole other topic we're not even going to get into. But, despite all of this, the party continued, and it was taking place in multiple apartments, but eventually, everyone kind of ended up in one apartment on the first floor, after a couple hours of kind of going, you know, back and forth, they all kind of landed in one apartment. So around 3 a.m., the party began to wind down, and Arpana headed back to her apartment, on the top floor of the complex. Now, in the following hour, neighbors heard what sounded like some consensual action coming from her apartment. Around 8 a.m., one neighbor heard what they described as a strange growling sound, followed by a thud, and then the sound of running water coming from Arpana's apartment. Investigators later suspected that this was around the time that Arpana's life came to a tragic end, and her killer was attempting to cover the crime. Two days later, one of the neighbors went to check on Arpana, and her body was discovered. Her autopsy revealed that she had been asphyxiated sometime between 3 a.m. and 8 a.m., in addition to being strangled with a boot lace, she had suffered a handful of blunt force trauma blows to the head, which broke several of her teeth. She had been gagged with 
single lead led to a dead end. And there really wasn't a clear motive as to why someone would want to do this to her. Lieutenant Doug Shepard said to a Redmond reporter that Arbana just didn't make enemies. She made friends, and she had a lot of them. There's no apparent reason why someone would want to take this person from the prime of her life. So for the next two years, this investigation would continue without any major progress. Until suddenly, it was announced that a suspect had been arrested. In October of 2010, charges were filed against a man named Emmanuel de Melvin Fair, also known as Anthony P. Parker, but we're just going to call him Fair because it's a lot of names. <laughs> so this man already had a criminal record. He was serving sentences for at least six other crimes, which included drug charges, firearm charges, as well as some essay offenses. Mr. Fair had been arrested and charged with essaying a minor. He pled guilty to avoid a longer prison sentence. Fair began to serve his four-year sentence in 2004 and he was released by the end of 2006 after being labeled a level one offender, meaning that he was the least likely to re-offend. Once Fair was released in 2006, he would struggle with homelessness and going in and out of prison for probation violations. During the time of Arpana's murder, he was couch surfing with a friend named Leslie who lived in the same apartment complex as Arpana. Later photographs would reveal that Fair was at the same Halloween party as Arpana and even had at least one brief encounter with her. Now, in his addition to his encounter with Arpana, he also spent some time with Cameron Johnson, who is the neighbor that discovered Arpana's body two days later. The two of them had never met before this party, but they were seen going downstairs to a car where they listened to music together. Now, both Johnson and Fair claim that this interaction didn't last any more than 30 minutes. So, in the two years leading up to the arrest of Emmanuel Fair, the investigation gathered DNA evidence from the scene. They coupled that with the inconsistencies in Emmanuel's story to build this case against him. Mr. Fair claimed he went home to his friend's apartment around 1 a.m. to sleep, but his cell phone records indicate that he made numerous phone calls between 2 and 5 a.m., including some to Leslie, the woman who he was living with. Now, during pretrial motions, Mr. Fair's attorneys would begin to assert his innocence. They stated that he had been unfairly targeted due to his race and prior criminal record. Most of the other partygoers were Caucasian and may have had even more motive for this murder. But, according to Emmanuel's attorneys, they did not receive the same level of hostility that he did during this investigation. In addition to this, there was also a discrepancy in the forensic analysis of the evidence, of course there was, which ended up being the longest lasting dispute in this case. This dispute would end up lasting several years in which Mr. Fair spent behind bars awaiting trial. So this company called True Allel, developed by Cybergenesis, I'm sorry, cybergenetics, I'm just adding letters, is a genotyping software used by law enforcement agencies for DNA analysis. What it does is it employs complex 
function known as uh, probabilistic genotyping is a crucial part of modern forensic testing. This company had a track record of aiding convictions across the country. In this specific case, they produced more definitive results than tr traditional, I can't speak today, crime lab analysis, suggesting that Emmanuel Fair is the murderer. However, Fair's defense alleged that, alleged, geez, Shannon, challenged the software's analysis and sought access to its source code to understand the basis of its conclusion. This led to a protracted legal battle as cybergenetics refused to disclose the source code to protect its trade secrets. Despite appeals, the code remained a secret, causing Fair to languish in jail while awaiting trial for a decade-old crime. Sorry, lots of big words. I tend to mess up on those when they're not my own. Emmanuel Fair's trial began in 2017, more than six years after his initial charge for Urbana Jenga's murder. Prosecutors sought an extended sentence due to the severity of the case. They claimed that Fair had met Arpana at the Halloween party, became infatuated with her, and later, between three and eight, he had committed this brutal crime. Prosecutors would use his criminal past, the fact that he had lied about his whereabouts during the time of the murder, and the DNA analysis to argue their case. The defense countered by pointing to possible alternative suspects, particularly Arbana's neighbor, Cameron Johnson, and highlighted multiple men's DNA at the crime scene. The defense also criticized the investigation's gaps and use of a psychic. The trial ended in a hung jury with jurors unable to agree on Fair's guilt. The prosecution planned to retry him, but the retrial was postponed for discretionary review by the Court of Appeals. So, at the same time, during 2017 and 2018, another legal battle was taking place. The state was trying to build a case that Emmanuel Fair had an accomplice for his crime. Fair's attorneys argued that it was unconstitutional to charge both Fair and the uncharged accomplice for the same crime, which doesn't make any sense to me. They also pointed to DNA evidence that implicated others, including the aforementioned neighbor, Cameron Johnson. Cameron was a key figure in this case. He had a close relationship with Arpana, and he admitted that he was attracted to her. He made two phone calls to her phone between 2.56 and 3.02 a.m., which he then proceeded to lie about when he spoke to the police. A witness also mentioned seeing someone who resembled Cameron Johnson near Arpana's apartment at around 3 a.m. Johnson's behavior also raised some suspicions. He claimed to have woken up around 10 a.m. the morning after the party, but his online activity revealed that he had printed maps for the local pawn shop and even attempted to cross the Canadian border earlier than that. Now, since Arpana's cell phone and digital camera were missing, this led investigators to believe that if Johnson was the killer, he had attempted to pawn these items. After failing to cross the border, Johnson showed up at a party later that day with a limp, indicating that he had been in some kind of physical struggle the night before. Other witnesses who know Johnson claim that he had made vague statements about going to Arpana's apartment in his sleep, and that he was unsure if he had killed her. Hello? Now, since Johnson had quit taking his medicine shortly prior to the day of the party, this was pretty troubling to hear. I agree. He couldn't recall key details about the murder time frame and 
had his DNA linked to evidence found at the crime scene. So prosecutors could not rule him out as a suspect, suggesting that he might be an uncharged accomplice. This, however, backfired since Fair's attorneys were able to build a defense around reasonable doubt, making this case quite complex. Emmanuel Fair's second trial began in 2019, and like the first, relied on DNA evidence to implicate him in Arpana's murder. With the state using the same true LL analysis, I'm sure I'm saying that wrong, Fair's defense attorneys, Benjamin Goldsmith and Catherine e Edwards, argued for reasonable doubt, and they pointed to Cameron Johnson as a more convincing suspect. They believed the incriminating physical evidence, prior relationship, and strange behavior made Cameron more likely to be the one who committed this terrible crime. Now, Cameron testified, but he was limited in the questions he could be asked, due to self-incrimination privilege, which ended up influencing the jury. They had no knowledge of Emmanuel Fair's prior mistrial, and the testimony that Cameron Johnson did nothing but create reasonable doubt, since he could no longer be referred to as the uncharged accomplice. The jury was initially deadlocked, and then reached a consensus on June 11, 2019. They found Emmanuel Fair not guilty. A juror stated that the state's inability to reconcile charges against Fair with evidence implicating Johnson led to the acquittal, emphasizing reasonable doubt rather than Fair's innocence. And after nine years in custody, Emmanuel Fair was released following his acquittal in Arpana Jenga's death. Now, Arpana's murder remains an unsolved case to this day, with almost minimal progress over the years. Authorities seem convinced they had the murderer in Emmanuel Fair and built their entire case around him. Once more, evidence showed Cameron Johnson may have been the perpetrator. It was a decision to have him as an accomplice, which gave Emmanuel's defense the ability to argue reasonable doubt. More than a decade has passed since Arpana's murder, and no one has been held accountable for it. She was just 24 years old when she lost her life on November 1st of 2008. She had already experienced an amazing life and career, and she had the potential to continue making positive contributions to the world. And one can only imagine what she may have achieved, and how many lives she may have influenced. Instead, her life was abruptly and violently cut short the morning after her Halloween party. And justice has yet to be served. So let's talk about this for a little bit, okay? So, um, I think that, um, okay, let's just, let's just not say that there was DNA evidence, okay? 